Yeah, well, obviously, we've had some fairly conflicting news out of uh, out of China, which I think has caused some of that buffeting between it looked like we were going to have a, a test maybe of 725 not too long ago. Um, and now we're here, we're knocking on the door of 730. So we've got those activity numbers that you've mentioned uh, coming out later in the week. And then depending on whether they're, uh, they do show some signs of improvement or whether they corroborate the sort of slightly disconcerting message that we got from the various PMIs, um, with the exception maybe of that uh, Kaising services number, um, it will have importance. What I would say also, though, is, and I've said this on, on numerous occasions, is that I think that the ongoing weakness of the Japanese yen is a consideration insofar as, uh, you know, a strengthening Chinese currency at this stage would deal China, you know, a further loss of competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Japan. So I think for all their sort of protests and, and a public desire for stability and the protests that they make at prevailing levels via the daily fixings, for as long as dollar yen, you know, is continuing to track, um, you know, above 150 and potentially breaking out to the upside, I think that imposes a strict limit on the willingness of the Chinese authorities to take action that would strengthen it. And also, from a monetary policy point of view, we've still got that divergence between uh, Fed and PBOC policy, some speculation that we could see further PBOC easing measures. And if that's the case, uh, that will further undermine the attractiveness of, uh, of Chinese, uh, particularly fixed income assets.